Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Ready? Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on, on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Let's stop right there for now. You know what life is? It's a quest to fulfill your hunger. And Paul, in his first stage of his life, fulfilled, he was on a quest to be a Pharisee, to be a law-abiding religious fanatic, and he succeeded. I mean, he was up there, he had the pedigree, and he had the results to prove it. You and I are on a quest, on a journey, and there's a hunger within us, and our quest in life, our journey, is about fulfilling that appetite, that hunger that we have. Now, I believe you've heard it said before, there's a God-shaped void in your life, and everybody seeks to fill that void. Now only God can fill it. Nothing else can satisfy your soul. Paul found that out. He had a hunger, a huge appetite for God. He gorged himself with the religion. He gorged himself with education. He gorged himself with his accomplishments, things that he valued, things that he prized, things that were dear to him. He filled his life with those things. He filled himself, but he found himself empty. Empty of life, he was miserable. You might say he was filled, but he was not fulfilled. Some of you sitting here today may be wondering, what's life all about? Some of you are listening. Thank you, Michael, for the video that he worked so hard to put online. But many of everybody is searching. Everybody is living a life, and that life is a quest a journey to feel that hunger. Now, God wants you to have a hunger for him. The world wants you to have a hunger for it. And we have competing appetites. Let's talk about that. He was filled but not fulfilled. And what? The things that was once very valuable to Paul, things that were very precious to him, now he considered absolutely worthless. Think about that for just a minute. Things that were, I mean, he, he sacrificed his life. He gave his life for these things. And then he was willing to give them up for Christ. <clears throat> Question I want to ask us as we end this year, what are you willing to sacrifice to have him? What are you willing to give up in order to gain him? Yes, you have to give up some things. If any man will come after me, Matthew 6, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Amen? Amen. Verse 7. What was once valuable and precious was now worthless compared 
to knowing Christ. I submit to you today the most important value that you will ever have, passion that you will ever have, is knowing Christ. Not knowing about him and not having a religious experience, but I'm talking about what Paul said, that I may know him. That intimate acquaintance with God. I want to gain him, gain Christ. So, what's your hunger? What are your desires? As we end the year, think about our appetites. What have we allowed to fill? What have, you, what have we been chasing this year? What have you been pursuing this year? What do you have to show for your pursuit? The cravings, the hunger, appetite, the values, the passion. What are you willing to sacrifice? I love to watch football, and and I see that, well, they, they sacrifice the hunt. I mean, they, these athletes are literally sacrificing their life, their health, their safety. They're, they're putting it all on the line for scoring points and winning games. Huh? Well, and then the professional, yes, making money. Thinking professional, but you're right. I'm with you, Pastor. You think well. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to ask yourself a question. Is, is the quest that you're on worth the price that you're going to pay? Is the quest that you're on, the things that you are giving up to gain whatever you're seeking, are they worth it? Because I, I submit to you at the end of your life, you won't have them. At the end, when all is over, as one author says, it all goes back in the box. When the game's over, it all goes back in the box. You leave this life with nothing unless you have Christ. And you leave it with everything. Is what you're in pursuit of worth the price that you're paying for? Look at what Paul gave up. He counted them but dumb. Refuge. That's trash. Dog manure, if you will. And I submit to you, anything less than Christ is trash. It will burn. It is refuge. Now, there's some good things. We're going to talk about that. But even they cannot take the place of the hunger of God in Family for one. So if any man come after you and hate, I'm going to explain it. The scripture says, King James says, if you hate not your father and mother, brother and sister, your wife and your children, and your own life also, you can't be my disciple. What's he say? Obviously, God does not want us to hate God. That's why you need something besides King James. But I love King James. I memorize it. But there's some other, some words that have changed that, that you can understand that. And so, what, it, what, you, what you need to read, I said, if any man prefer his wife over me, if you prefer your children over me, if you prefer your mother or father over me, if you prefer anything over me, you cannot follow me. Come on, man. Well, what kind of claim is that? He's simply saying, i got to be first in your life. I need to be your first pursuit. I am number one. I'm either Lord or I'm not Lord. Am I number one in your life? Are the things that you're sacrificing worth the cost that you're going to pay for what you get? I submit to you, if it ain't Jesus, you seek him first, you'll love your wife more. And this ain't about neglecting our family. For, no, because the Bible says he's a fool that neglects his own family. So it's not like putting, it's just like putting them, you're number two, baby. How about that? We should over and tell the Jerry, he said, you're number two. Ah! He said, well, I don't know. No. He said, that's risky, that's risky. No. That's it. My children, they come after God. My wife comes after God's got to be number one. Can I hear an amen? God's got to be number one. Seek ye 
first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What a blessed family. What a blessed children. What a blessed job. All those good things, when they are subordinate to God, become a blessing in your life. All those good things, when they are not subordinate to God, become a curse in your life. You know what they actually are? An idol. It's an idol. Because you set it up before God. God will not be number two. He died to be king. You can't have him. Number two. So we have a battle of appetite. Galatians 5, 17 declares the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. Desires of the spirit are against the flesh. These are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So we have two sets of cravings and appetite, hungers. And we're in this world, but the Bible says we're not of this world. And that's why if we seek first the kingdom of God, that's how we keep from fulfilling the fleshly desires, we need to be filled with the Spirit. See, that's the problem we have. We're not full of God, right? Not, maybe you're not hungry for God. If that's the case, then we've allowed the things of the world, good things and bad things, to fill that place, and you're not hungry. Why? Because you're already filled. You've allowed the things of the world, things of the flesh, to, to fulfill, take the place of God being number one. What do we hunger for most is what we worship. That's what we do now. What I was are the things we worship. And you can worship them and you don't have to like, get a little bit of sing a song. But you're paying homage to the things that you're most hungry for. you hunger for most. That's what you're going to seek. And that's what worship is. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Worship him. Seek the Lord while he may be found. What you hunger for is what you end up worshiping. You give your life to that. You put it on a pedestal. That's what I want. I'm going after it. I'm going after it. It may be a job. It may be money. It may be fortune. It may be whatever it is. It can take the place of God and be an idol in your life. What masters us has become our God, and what we hunger for most, we worship. Here's explained in Luke chapter eight, verse fourteen. As for what fell among the thorns, talk about the word of God, the seed, the word of God. They are those who hear the word, but as they go on their way, they're choked by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. We allow other things to fill our life. And you can't be hungry if you're already full. And therein lies the predicament we can find ourselves in if we're not careful. We don't put a guard on. Because of the competing desires, the competing appetites, the flesh lusting against the spirit, the flesh don't want what the spirit wants. And the spirit don't want what the flesh wants. There's a battle of appetites. You need to ask yourself, hey, who am I going to allow to win? Who am I going to allow to win? The choice is ours. We hear the word, but the words of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, desire for other things to come in and choke the word. We have a responsibility to not let these things in. Amen? They come in. They come in through various avenues. But we need to be discerning. And if it's not of the Spirit, and it doesn't satisfy God's desires for our life, don't allow them to choke and to crowd out. The cravings can be for food. Cravings can be for love. Cravings can be for an, uh, affection. Power. Money. The 
his desires for other things. That's the enemy of the good. You know, I, I don't know who said it. Uh, I don't know that I even wrote it down right, but I'm going to read it. The greatest enemy of the hunger for God is not poison, but appetite. The greatest enemy of the hunger for God is not poison, but appetite. It's not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for God and his kingdom. But it's the nibbling at the table of the world. Think about that. Most people in here are not out of worship because I don't think you've got to think. But if we're not careful, this little nibble, this little nibble, this little nibble, we allow this to come in. We allow this to come in. And we don't read the word and we're not in prayer and we're not seeking the face of God and seeking the will of God and in the word of God. These things crowd in and they choke what is of God that's in you. Takes the God life right out of you. And we find ourselves empty and no hunger for God because of the replacement that's taking place. The replacement. In Luke chapter 14, verse 18 through 20. Uh, for the sake of time, let me. Jesus is, is a parable. And uh, said, uh, said he, the ruler sent the folks out to bring them into the bank. Go get me some banquet eaters. And which one guy said, I, I just bought a, a, a piece of ground. Would you give me an excuse? He went to another fellow. He said, I, I just required, uh, uh, acquired five yoke of oxen. Will you give me excuse? Will you, will you let me go on the count of that? I can't come. No, I can't come because I've just married a wife. Man, <laughs> oxen or wife? <laughs> come on, man. Come on, man. But we all have these excuses. And God has invited us to the table. Hey, woo, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and I'll sup with him and he with me. Let's dine together. Let's fellowship together. Let's commune together. I long for your fellowship and communion. I died to receive it. The pleasures for thy pleasure. They are created. All things are created for the pleasure of God. And he longs to have us at his side, at his table. With an intimate, close fellowship. But I've got this in the book. Things that we've allowed to feel the pursuit that we're on, the price that we're paying, the getting things that certainly will not last. The greatest enemies of the love and passion for God is, can be his gifts. I will see wife is a gift. I shall be blessed with the gift. Took me long enough to get her. Talk about a pursuit, man. Swim the ocean, cross the day. <laughs> Christ was worth it. But here's another good thing. Oxen. Oxen is a blessing. But it became an idol. Land is a blessing unless it's not subordinate to God. What are you allowing that God has even given you the greatest enemy of the best God has for you can be the blessing that he's given you. Because you put it above God. Might be land, might be options, whatever, possessions. It could be people. Things in our life that God intends to be a blessing. What has us? And it's the 
It's the value that we place on those things. And I believe God wants to bless our lives with things, material things. I said, Lord, I bless my children. I believe God, he wants to bless us as we come up under him. So, Lord, he wants to bless you more than you can even imagine. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. He that spared not his only son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? God don't want you to lack anything. That's not a daddy. That's not a father that loves you. God wants to bless you. But he certainly don't want that blessing to become a hindrance and an idol. Don't allow the greatest gifts that God has given you to be the enemy of your passion and love for Him. Uh, I made a list here. Food, gardening, reading, decorating, traveling, investing, fishing, hunting. I be uh, oh! No, I know. I'm just joking. Just because you, no, I'm kidding. I, I gotta go. I gotta leave that. No, I am joking. I, I don't. TV watching, internet surfing. Should have worn my steel toe shine. Chopping. Woo! Why not do that after this thing? Exercising. All of these things can become the very enemy of God in the pursuit of his love in your life. Good things can do great damage. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 3. Paul describes his life, his hunger for God. There's some things I believe as we look into 2018 that he's, he's advising us on. We need to let go of your past. Let's read verse 12 together. Verse 12. Not that I've already attained, obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it known or make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I love that scripture. Woo, look what God has done for me. He has possessed me. He's made me his own. And I'm going to pursue all that he is. I want to be all that he wants me to be. I want to have all that he wants me to have. Because he died and paid a great price to satisfy my soul. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies ahead. So if you're going to receive what God has for you. Forgetting what lies behind, straining, stretching, pursuing, pressing forward to what lies ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's a prize, folks. Let me tell you, just right now, the greatest reward you'll ever have is knowing God and doing His will. That's the prize. That's the prize. The prize. Is his calling on your life. His reward. His calling is his reward. I press for the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Let those of us who are mature think this way. What is he saying? Let go of the past. I want to gain Christ. Forget the, even the, sometimes, and, 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 I mean, I forget all the, the victory, but don't cling to it. Don't leave it back there. There's even more. There's more. God wants us to move. God wants us to go forward. God wants us to advance. And sometimes we relish in the victories that we had in the past. Praise God. I've heard some football teams talking, man, when they used to do this, they were good, they were good. And they always told me, God wants us to, Reach forward. Thank God for the past. Good, the bad, and ugly. And everything you think, but this is the will of God. 
I think of what I learned when my failure. I think of what I learned when I made that mistake. I'm failing forward. I'm getting up. I'm not quitting. I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I fell down, but I didn't stay down. Amen? Amen. And I learned from my mistakes. I'm not going to allow my past to hinder my future. Offenses. We need, to for, we need to forget what people have done to us. You might have been hurt lately. And you might have been offended lately. The worst thing you can do is cling to that. Absolutely. You'll never know God in his fullness if you hang on to a hurt in your life. Never. Because you won't know the forgiveness of God until you've forgiven that person that hates you, that's hurt you, and yes, hates you. I believe with all my heart the measure that our love for God is the measure that we Love our enemies. Scripture says anybody who loves your friends. <laughs> That's easy, isn't it? It's easy. You tell me you love God? How do you treat those people that treat you the worst? You don't love God any more than how, than how you treat them. That's the measure of the love. That's miraculous. That's, that's supernatural. See, because it, it doesn't take nothing. It don't even take God to love your friends. You can do that without God. But you can't forgive those people that have despised you and used you and, and, and hated you and done that. It takes the Spirit of God to do it, and that's what you have. Woo! Hallelujah. Don't listen to the lie of the, the devil. They, I, I just can't forgive them. I just can't do it. Yes, you can. Through Christ. I can do all things. Through Christ. Who gives me strength. So forgive the hurts. Release the people and let them go. Don't be in bondage to them. The mistakes, the failures, these are other things that we need to forget, that we need to lay aside, that we need to leave there. Thank God what I learned from them. From them. You know, I made some mistakes, I made some wrong choices, but I'm getting up and I'm going forward. I'm stretching. I'm, I love that we're reaching for, and, it, and it's indicative of stretching. I'm not just, man, I'm a, well, it even feels good to stretch, no. Because some people don't feel like they haven't reached far enough. But you got to get out of your comfort zone and just right there to, ah, oh, I hope I don't tear something. <laughs> yeah? But you feel better after you stretch. Some people say, ah, oh, just, they, they don't step out there, and so they never feel good. You know what I mean? They just feel always in it, man. But I'm telling you, if you're not reaching far, then you're not challenging yourself. And I believe God made you be a challenge. Amen. Don't settle for what's just right there. Yeah. Reach out for more. Stretch. The victory is the success. Don't cling so tight to the good that you miss God's best. And press forward, he said. Pursue your future. And again, this pursuit is not a casual thing. It's a passionate pursuit. <laughs> To advance. And I love what he says. I'm going to apprehend those things for which I have been apprehended of by Christ. God, Christ got a hold of my life. A song like that. Jesus got a hold of me. And I won't let you go. Okay. Okay. But not only will I not let him go, see, I want all that he has provided for me. I want all of his provision. I want to make it my own. Now, he's already given it to me, see? But I have to receive what his provision. I'm not working to earn it. It's all by grace. I'm just reaching out there, and I'm not allowing anything, my past or my present, to get in the way of what God has for my life. I'm stretching, I'm pursuing, and I'm reaching for what God, what lays ahead of me in God. I want to do some things this morning. I want the worship team to come. As I said before, I know it's true in my life, and I want this to be in all of our lives. Our prayer. The last day of this year, God, give me a hunger. But I know. You'll not see 
that for which you don't hunger. And if you don't seek it, you won't find it. So what do we have to do for that hunger? I believe it comes from God. See, God will give you, minister to you, and create in you that hunger for God. It's not something that you even work up. Amen? It's something that God, I believe, gives you. Uh, no man comes to the Father except the, the Father draw him. So God wants to put, it's a, it's a God-given desire. So what you have to do is say, Lord, I want it. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to achieve it. See, that's what Paul was saying. And I, he said, I want to gain Christ and be found in him. See, he had already found righteousness apart from God. He found it in the Lord. I want to be found in him. I don't want to be found in my achievements. I don't want to be found in my glory. I don't want to be found in the good things that I've done, thinking, I look, for, look what I've done, God. Look what I've earned. God, you blessed me. Look what I've No. That's rubbish. That is trash. That is refuse. I want to be found in him. Not having my own righteousness. But that which is by faith. That which is in God. Listen to me. He's already done the work. Amen. He's already done the work. That's why the scripture says we are, he is our righteousness. He is our righteousness. I want us to do something today. And just all of us come to this altar. Let's stand and come. And let's just ask God to give in us a hunger. Because see, if we have the hunger, we're going to seek to get that appetite for people. I promise you. If you have the hunger, you're going to, okay, God, feel that appetite. But that hunger has to be from God. Would y'all come? And just as a church, let's come to the altar. We're going to sing.